Welcome back. Thank you. It's time for my next guest. She is reigned supreme on our Olympic screens over the last month. Uh, she did a job far better than anyone else could have done. She blew everyone away, and really, I think it was just an incredible performance. It's time she won the goal. Will you please welcome the wonderful Claire Balding? <laughs> Dame Balding. <laughs> Great to have you. Take a seat, get comfortable. How lovely to have you I here. just did what I did when I did the flowers as well. Jazz hands. I get panicky <laughs> and I just don't know what to do. Well, look. Jazz hands. The thing is, after the event, it's always easier to say, of course, someone would have been the perfect person for that job. But I'm sure before you did the Olympics, before you, you know, everyone said, wow, what a knockout performance. I bet you were daunted by it. I bet you found it to be a task. So, uh, were you worried? Were you scared? No, I was very nervous. I mean, you... There's a lot to learn, and, and particularly knowing that I was going to work on the Olympics and the Paralympics. Yeah. But in many ways, the timing was perfect. You know, I had done four Olympic Games before. I'd done three Paralympics before. I had enough experience to know how to get through that length of time, because it is a bit of an endurance test. Yeah. So You're you working long, long hours for day after day after day. Uh, you mentioned you went straight from the Olympics to the Paralympics, OK? Uh, an exciting thing, but were you worried that maybe the level of interest, the level of excitement and euphoria that we felt during the Olympics would transfer to the Paralympics, or did you think it might feel a little, you know, that maybe they should have gone first? I, I was actually always of the opinion that the Paralympics would have more impact, in, in a way, more long-term impact than the Olympics. I think the Paralympics genuinely has the power to change the world. And I was so thrilled that it was coming home, you know, that, that coming back to the country that actually invented it. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think that was a major moment. And now when I meet a lot of kids, you know, want to talk about the Paralympic Games, they watched it and they, it really mattered to them. And I think we had, you know, really exciting new heroes created. Yeah. I mean, Johnny Peacock, who's, who's yeah. you know, still a teenager, who's absolutely gorgeous, wins the 100 metres. Yeah. And, and he is a new pin-up for people. And I think the same with Ellie Simmons. Ellie and... Simmons, when she oh, won the first, uh, I, yeah. I just, I was in tears. It was such an emotional moment. And she's so charming, lovely, the smile she's got. Yeah. Wow, what a star. She is, she's fantastic. And you think she went to her first Paralympic Games when she was 13. Yeah. And came back, you know, not understanding at all how much of a star she would be. And, and now she's much wiser. I mean, she's still only 17, yeah. but... She did really well. Incredibly. and Oh, yeah. And she's so cool with it all. And, and, you know, same in the Olympics with Tom Daly. I mean, they are sports equivalent of Justin. Yeah. And I'm just really, really impressed with how they get on with it all. I was on the floats. Um, I was in, on the, working on the parade on Monday. We got to Trafalgar Square and, and, you know, the buses all slowed down, or the floats, or whatever they're called, all slowed down. And all these thousands and thousands of people. And I think I was with Chris Hoy at that point, as you are. And um, a <laughs> yeah, little reflector glory, stand close to Chris Hoy, they'll all cheer. Attend <laughs> <laughs> this for me. Um, watch that gold medal reflect <laughs> off my chin. <laughs> and, um, and I looked out at that crowd and he was saying to me, he said, you know, this isn't about them saying thank you to us, it's about us saying thank you to them for their support. And he's a very wise man, Chris wow. Roy, he's a fantastic man. And I just looked out there and the bottom lip went completely and I really lost it. I was very, very emotional and you just think, oh, this, this did something fabulous to our country. Yeah. It did something fantastic to London. Everyone started talking to each other. Yeah. It was great on the tube and on the train and on the, you know, on the bus. Everybody's going, oh, did you see that last night? And that big shared experience and everybody, you know, the first real Twitter Olympics, so everybody's tweeting about it and okay. sharing it in that way, going to big parks, watching on big screens. But it just filled us with joy and I love that and I want to hold on to that. It was great. <laughs> The, the remarkable, you're doing it in a way because this wasn't, I would have thought, the career you had mapped out for yourself. I mean, you had a sporty upbringing, you had a, you know, a, a kind of life which was really, uh, it was built around horses. It was your love of horses. Yeah. That was your, your teenage years, your youth, and that's, I guess, how you wanted the future to go. And yet... You... I don't know that it was. I'm not sure I had any clear idea of what... I wanted to write books. That's what I wanted well, to do. Well, oh, that's and a, then, yes, what a and lovely link, because have... Claire has a book out. <laughs> I've been reading it, genuinely been reading it, really enjoying it. Claire Baldy, My Animals and Other Family. I know you should put animals before family. Yes. Because it is kind of... There's an, an animals in every chapter, aren't there? Yes. Well, every chapter is a different animal, and it's got lovely illustrations at the beginning of, of yeah. each chapter of the various ponies and horses and dogs. No pictures of your mums or dads drawn in this, but lots of illustrations of the animals. Yeah, so that's they're, they're, what it's they're the kind of big thing, mm. really. Yeah. Um, it seems like you had a fairly eccentric, <laughs> you know, an eccentric upbringing, because there you are. I don't know how old you are there. I guess you, I'd guess you're about three, maybe, or something like that. Yeah, something like that. You've got a dog collar around your yeah. head. Well, I thought I was a dog. Oh. Well, you do. Lots of people do, don't they? <laughs> so I would sleep in the dogs' beds with them, and I, you know, sometimes... Oh, I mean, drinking from the dogs' water bottle, that's fine, isn't it? Wow. 
Is that fine? It is I mean, fine. It's I tried unusual. A, I did try. <laughs> I tried eating a bonio biscuit once, but that was a bit dry. I didn't like it much. You know. Why did you? Because you were just little and a bit confused. Well, because the or? dog. No, the dog's got a lot of attention and a lot of love, and their life seemed to be very nice. So yeah. I just wanted to be one of them. Hold it. Look how cool Liam is with a toothpick in there. Look. Yeah, yeah, you got the toothpick in there. That looks like the kind of weirdest father and son movie ever made. Hey, hey. But <laughs> I think we've just found the plot for Taken 3. <laughs> <laughs> it's not preachy at all, but there is a kind of, there is a sort of message in it as well. There, you're talking often about your father's kind of refusal to, in, in a humorous way, about his uh, belief that women weren't and aren't indeed equal to men. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a sort of, you know, women ate people was the family joke. Um, and, and I, I that, think... Can yeah. I just say... That, so funny. That's a hilarious joke. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What a great joke. But you see, this is... You, you, when, you, when you do have to fight for um, attention, and, and I think lots of people do in, through their family life and through their school years, when you do have to do it, when you see a summer like this where women, particularly women in sport, are so celebrated, and when you see a whole range of women on air, on screen, that are all shapes and sizes, that have all different personalities, you have to know that's important yeah. and rejoice in that and say, this is huge, because it wasn't always like that, and quite often it still isn't always like Even that. Even in recent history, I mean, that's what we forget. It was only yeah. a few years ago. But the fact, I mean, you've kind of broken the mould anyway. The fact that you cover the rugby sometimes on TV. The I rugby know, league, gotta, yes. You know, that, that would seem traditionally not a woman's role. In the past, I'm sure your dad would find it quite alarming that you, you landed that job. I, I think he found it quite alarming. Lots of things I did. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of presenting sport, yeah, I think. But now I don't, I don't think... It... <laughs> In terms of presenting sport... Was he... OK, well, let me ask the question. Was he cool when you came out? Was he relaxed he about that? He was really cool, yeah. He really was. And he's great and he adores Alice. And they play golf together quite often without me because I'm not good enough. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, he is super cool. And actually, I rang him this morning because I was worried that some people's take on the book might be that he was too harsh. Yeah. And he said, don't you worry about it. I think it's a fantastic book and I'm cool with this. Um, uh, the book's a great read. It's out now. And I suspect this is a, a perfect time to come out. There's a story in I love about, you know, it's a very unusual childhood, very unusual experience. Not many of us ever came home and found the Queen sitting in our front room or in the dining room having mm. breakfast with the family. But you did. I did, yes. And my father had either forgotten to tell me or I hadn't listened, either is likely. Um, and so he'd forgotten to say the Queen was coming for breakfast. And, um, and <laughs> well, the Queen would come, like, twice a year to see her horses and he trained her racehorses. And so she her, would... your father trained the horses yeah. and you had the horses there. Yeah. So there was a reason. It wasn't she yeah, didn't yeah, just yeah. drop in it, very rudely. Didn't, no, just said, I'm coming for breakfast, what have you got? She loves free um, food, but yeah. she was, there was a reason <laughs> away. And I'd forgotten, so I come herring in and I'm in my really dirty job purse and I've got a rugby shirt on and a spotted cheap, you know, handkerchief around my neck because that was a really good look then. And I come herring in and there's the Queen sitting at the head of the table. And I kind of missed my moment to curtsy and say, Your Majesty, and do all the things that you're meant to say. So there's a gap and I just go, oh, great, sausages. <laughs> I'm going to help myself to I mean, fantastic cook breakfast. And I was going through a stage of, um, there's a very, well, my, half my family's uh, American and there's quite an American delicacy, which is sausages on toast with marmalade. So I'm, it's well, delicious. That sounds disgusting. Oh, no, no, it's delicious. <laughs> um, but it is quite difficult to cut a sausage long ways, um, delicately, and if you're a bit nervous and the Queen is sitting at the table, the, a bit like a bar of soap, it is quite likely to just go shooting off the table, which it did. Um, you didn't hit Her Majesty? Towards the Queen. No, no, I grabbed it But even then, then, that's a treason I, offence, I think. If you you, you, you hurl half a sausage at Her at Majesty. The, yeah, I, and, and I went to grab the sausage and I knocked over the milk and it just, oh, it was oh. awful. And then my father growled at me like he growled at the dogs. And, <laughs> and my mother hissed and it was just horrible. And the Queen raised an eyebrow. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great story in there, actually, I think, which, it, which illustrates the Queen's sense of humour more than, more than anything. My father would ring her would ring all his owners on a Sunday, so he rings the Queen in 1979, in May of 1979. And bear in mind, my father didn't really read anything other than The Sporting Life at the time, and now <laughs> The Racing Post. So if things appeared in The Sporting Life or The Racing Post, he knew, he knew they'd happened. Yeah. So there was betting on the general election, so he knew the general election had happened, and he kind of knew who'd won. So the Queen says to him, and what do you think of the election result? And he says, genuinely says, well, I don't know, it's going to take a bit of time to get used to a woman running the country. He said to the Queen. <laughs> and it's just like, how, 
how could you? How could you say that to the Queen? <laughs> and I think, to her great credit, she didn't take her horses away, you know? She, st <laughs> she clearly thinks he's amusing. Or she, said it as a joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, he got away with it. He got away with it. <laughs> um, I love the book. Uh, I love seeing you on TV. Every episode. You're just, just an incredible you. job. I know everyone said that to you, but it, the reason why everyone said it is because it's true. So you have um, great affection for everyone and also respect as well, I think, which is important. Uh, how lovely to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, Claire Balding. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. It was great. It was great fun. Oh, yeah. The lovely Claire Balding. Join us after the break. I'll be talking to the Prince of Pop, Justin Bieber, and we'll have live music from The Killers, so don't go away. <laughs>